What's up, everybody? Welcome to another YouTube episode. We are here with the Alina Tanner um, in New York City. We're going to have kind of an interview style building off some of the previous episodes that we've done, especially um, specifically teaching or talking about PRI, Postural Restoration Institute. Um, below, we'll link some of the other stuff that we've done on that if you want to catch up with that first. And we're going to talk a lot about integration between vision, dental, talk a little bit about shoes, and um, just learn some. So let's first start off by having Lena do a little bit of an intro. Where are you currently? <laughs> Who do you work with? And anything else you want to share? So where am I currently? I've been in a few states in the last few months. I'm trying to figure out what state works best for me. But right this minute, we're in New York. We're at a clinic called Funk Physio that I am working with and kind of work out of. I mainly am based out of New York. The practitioners I work with are here and my business just happens to be here. New Yorkers tend to really need what I do. Um, what else was, you wanted to know a little bit about me. So yeah, and who, who you work with, population. I work with really everybody. I'd say some people come to me really to optimize, and then some people are coming to me with their chronic health issues. So chronic pain, um, you know, just different things that they might be dealing with a lot lately, like people with POTS and all these other neurological symptoms and issues that they've been having. But mainly, those are the two uh, sections of people that come to see me. So, um, yeah. Uh, what else? You want to know a little bit about me and like how I got here? Is that what? Or what? Yeah, yeah, or whatever, sure. whatever question you wanted me to answer. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Just go ahead and tell us a little bit about you, uh, um, you know, how you've gotten here. What maybe uh, since we're going to talk about PRI so much, yeah. maybe go through you know sure. the courses you've taken. Okay, perfect. So I started to take PRI courses in 2018. Originally, I went to University of Arkansas and became a certified athletic trainer. And after that, I just felt like what I was learning in school didn't really match up to what could help people. So I got into a bunch of different things and PRI happened to make the most sense to me. So I took my first course in 2018. Here in New York City, I took respiration. Eventually a year, I like slept on the information for a while because it was very dense and I couldn't handle it. Um, a year later, I took myokin. I've taken all the primary courses. I've taken for tertiary and secondary courses. I've taken um, cervical occlusion, which is teeth. Uh, I took over the weekend cranial. I've taken all their non-manual technique courses. I've taken a bunch of the PRI courses. I'm trying to think. I've took, taken the seminars. So I've just taken a bunch of courses. And I also moved to Texas to really learn this information because in my opinion, it was very hard to learn in this city. I also during COVID needed to just get out of Manhattan. So I moved to Texas, mentored under somebody who had a lot more experience than I had, and it was the best opportunity of my life. And I really attribute that time period of my life to why I'm able to do PRI at this level with integration, with dentists, with optometrists, et cetera. So that is why I'd say I'm a little bit different because of that experience in my life. So I really use PRI on a daily basis. It's mainly what I do. Awesome. So let's give her a shout out and yeah. uh, where you can find her and her Instagram. Too. Yeah. So her Instagram, she's going to hate me for this, but we'll give it out. Her Instagram is prism.dpt and she's in Fort Worth, Texas. Her name is Casey Ratliff. So that's a big uh, she was a very big influence on me and my journey here. So she's a good follow when she posts. She doesn't post much, but when she does, it's like a stream of posts and it's awesome. Good. So there, there's for anybody that's looking to uh, find help in that area, they'll be able to find yeah. her. It's a lot closer to Manhattan for you. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and get into some of the questions. I'm going to kind of read some off of my phone. So why don't we start off by talking about the uh, your assessment process and you know, everybody that's watching this should have already kind of seen, you know, the adductive drop test, the horizontal abduction. So a lot of the things that Josh ran us through. Sure. When it comes to assessing vision, when it comes to assessing dental, um, what does the assessment process kind of look like? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it is a little bit different for everybody, but at the same time, I have an underlying list of questions that I'm going through to make sure I'm not really skipping things. So just the overall assessment process first, general assessment, I always do certain things. I'm always doing adduction drop test. I'm always checking hip IR and ER. I do it in a seated position. I'm always checking squat. I'm always checking toe touch, so like standing reach. I check straight leg raise. I check neck freedom, lateral flexion, and then um, rotation. 
Um, I check IR, shoulders, and horizontal abduction, and all these things, these range of motion testing, I put it in quotes because it's not really range of motion testing, it's actually you're looking at the system, you're looking at the neurological control of that person and the tension in that nervous system. So I test all of that prior um, to really implementing any of my techniques or modalities. Um, when it comes to vision and dental specifically, I ask certain questions. I ask, you know, time of day that person might have their pain because that could attribute to one of those things. You know, with vision, I ask a lot of, do you, did you have any learning issues as a child? I'll ask, uh, did you get car sick? Do you still get car sick? Do you have, a, of course, vision, we think of eyes and sight. But vision, it's not just about being 20-20, it's really about how you understand your spatial awareness. So I'll ask questions about, did they walk into furniture growing up or now? Um, that tells me a lot about where they know their center is in space. Uh, when it comes to dental, I will ask them, of course, about grinding teeth. Have they had teeth pulled? Uh, braces. Braces is a big one. Do they feel like they feel one side of their mouth more than other? Do they chew on one side of their mouth more than the other? That is also like a pretty, you know, most people do chew on one side more than the other, and that's also semi-normal, but is it excessive? Do they never alternate side to side? Did they have a lot of root canals? Did they have recent cavities in the last few years that were filled? It's, does it line up with their pain? A lot of, uh, also with, we'll go back to vision in a second, but also with all this stuff, I'm trying to timeline it. I'm trying to see, did they just recently have an eye prescription that changed four months ago? Like my patient earlier today, three months ago had a new eye prescription, and then three months later she's having hip pain. So you have to timeline it out and know, you know, did anything change within this time period? So. Okay, great. Yeah. Now, in terms of um, getting the whole big picture, like you mentioned, and then when it comes time to actually go and assess their actual vision, are you doing that process? Are you taking them to the integration of yeah. the eye doctor? Um, is there maybe a first one that you'll do before you officially take them right. there, like a left stance or something where they look mm -hmm. left, right, or whatever? Sure. Um, what, what would you say about that? Yeah, so when it comes to checking someone's vision, I will sometimes patch an eye and see, like, does their system tension down if I'm patching an, one eye, a di another eye just depends on the person. So that's like a little test. It's not going to change anything necessarily long term, but I'm just messing with their system to see hey, is this like a piece that I might be missing? I will do some balance testing. I'll see, of course, gait really tells me a lot. There are certain tests within the PRI world, like um, horizontal abduction is a really big visual test. So I'm looking at that first. I will def I do most of the vision stuff actually happens when I'm at the optometrist's office. Of course, it has to be the right person I'm sending to them. I'm not gonna just send anybody to my optometrist. They have to be a visually driven person. Um, the other things I'll think about is like, where is their pain? Is it, has it been forever? Is it everywhere? Um, is it when they're walking outside? So there's really the history and what they're telling me leads me to thinking, oh, this might be a visual case. But I will do some balance testing. I will patch an eye and see, is their balance different or has it changed with that eye patched? Um, I'll do certain cervical techniques in a left stance position. And if I see like a major problem with it, then it just gets my gears going and me thinking like, oh, there could be something further down the line with this person. Okay. And um, I think a common misconception, at least that I've heard a lot about the PRI stuff and specifically about the vision and the teeth is that people will kind of think, oh, day one, I noticed your teeth are off. Let's immediately go right to yeah. doing that. Let's, let's give you new glasses day one. And I think that that's the opposite of what you hear when you actually talk to someone doing that. Is yeah. that true? Yeah, and also, like, PRI has never said that. They're always like, wait as long as you can. Like, you have to be three out of five on the Horoska LISP test to integrate. And that's something that I think is pretty important. You do not want to tell somebody day one, hey, I think you have a visual problem, because you do not know, period. Yeah. You just don't know. Even when I see a crossbite, which is a pretty obvious um, asymmetry, I don't, I'll treat it via techniques, but I'm not telling them we have to go see a dentist. Like I'm gonna wait as long as possible because I have seen people with crossbites and LASIK and all these things that are supposed to be like not great, that aren't, they're not great, it's not supposed to be, they're just not great for you to have and they're an asymmetry that's visible external, but I've seen people be fine with the right techniques. 
So it also depends on the person, the person's personality, and who they really are, because a lot of people can override these external asymmetries, but I think that goes back to who that individual really truly is. And in this city, I happen to see a lot more stressed out people that are in sympathetic overdrive, and sometimes those people cannot override those external asymmetries, it's gone too far, and that's when we'll give a splint. But it has to be a couple sessions in. I actually have a rule with myself about what techniques I give on certain sessions and when I'm allowed for myself to tell somebody, hey, let's schedule an eye appointment, hey, let's schedule a dentist appointment. Okay. I just think it's appropriate. And since you already touched on it, can you give us your views or your experience maybe with someone with braces that also has you know, issues, someone who has a history of doing LASIK? Sure. Or any of that stuff. Yeah, so I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with braces. I just think that if you're putting braces on a kid, there's a couple things. You don't want to pull teeth first to get braces on, which is a very old school method that was done, you know, a while ago. I'm sure some older orthodontists are still doing that. You never want to pull extract teeth for braces to make room in the mouth to get the teeth straight. That's that's like a big no. You definitely want to expand and there's ways to do so. I think braces is not necessarily a problem. I think the body, you have to work with the body. So when we're just shifting teeth around in let's say a 16 year old and they're an athlete and you're just shifting those teeth, there could be a problem because that body may get locked up. And I think if somebody's managing the neck and the rest of the body, it's fine. If they're doing alternating movement, they should be fine. So if they're playing sports, most of the time people are fine with braces. It's not a problem. The other thing I will say is head injuries. Um, just knowing has this kid had tons of head injuries prior to getting braces. Maybe those head injuries should be addressed first. Just different things to think about. So I don't necessarily think braces are a bad thing. I think a lot of times people need braces to actually get their bite in a better position. I just think timing is really important when it comes to braces. And even for like older adults that are getting braces or Invisalign, it's the same thing. Timing is very, very important. If you're going to the dentist and you've never had your body assessed by somebody to say, hey, you're in a great position, your cervical spine has the amount of range of motion I'm looking for, you can go get braces. I think that that's where it gets tricky. The other thing too is kids tend to get braces really young. Like I got braces when I was 10. That's too young. Your heel bones are not fused. Your calcaneus is not fused at the age of 10, it fuses at 12. Your molars are not in yet until you're 12. You have your 12 year old molars. Why are we moving teeth when all our teeth are not even in our mouth? So that's just something to think about if there are people on here that have kids and you know are thinking about that. That's, I think, an important point. Um, when it comes to LASIK, I, I, I don't know. I think LASIK is, can be much more detrimental than braces, but it's really hard to compare because one is vision, one is dental. But in my opinion, LASIK from an up Optometry standpoint, you know, I think there's like a 10 times more chance later in life for retinal detachment. Like there's actual opto optometric issues and neural optometrists do not like LASIK. They think that it's, you're changing the shape of the, I think it's a lens or the cornea, but it's just not a natural thing to happen to an eyeball. And when it comes to our view PRI with it, if you're in a pattern where you're favoring one side of your body and then you go and change your shape of your eyeball, your body's gonna always go to that dominant side. So LASIK can be, I actually saw a patient today and that's what we worked on. We actually, he was overcorrected. So you're basically forcing your eyes to see this prescription, but in five years from now, your vision might change. Mine has changed. So what's it to say that that prescription is gonna be your perfect prescription? Just because for four or five years it's been the same script does not mean it won't change in the future. And then what happens is somebody went and got LASIK because they don't want to wear glasses, but their prescription went down a full diopter and now their eyes are over-focusing and trying so hard to see, to see and focus that their body is high in tension. So I have a much harder time with LASIK and I have even a harder time with monovision. And we could talk about that too. And monovision is basically when eye doctors will correct one eye to see up close and one eye to see far. And a lot of times they do the left eye to see close and the right eye to see far, which ultimately are, it should be opposite. We should use our left eye to actually see far. So I have a really hard time with that. And neurooptometrists also have a hard time with that because your brain is not meant to see to do that. You need binocular vision. The vision should work together. And when you're doing that to your eyeballs, it's very confusing on a brain. I tend to see a lot of people that have that with chronic pain. That's just 
what happens. And unfortunately, sometimes that is LASIKed onto people's eyes. So it's a permanent thing. You can change it. You can go to an optometrist and you know, have to wear one contact all the time to make the vision even or balanced, but it's such a hassle. So I think for me, LASIK, it's a big no. Okay, and then in terms of a common question that I get actually is about um, expanding your palate. So just the idea of like, thinking like the roof of your mouth is very narrow. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will say, well, I'm 46 years old. Like how much more expansion can I really get? I don't even want to go down that path right. because I don't think it can change. How do you feel about the ability for the, uh, the expansion to happen at an older age at the palate? Um, so this, it's a tough question because at, at a young age, it can change. The skull is very malleable, the palate can move, and you could do myofunctional therapy and you could do certain things and we can get a lot of results. At an older age, 46 years old, the palate is not going to expand. It is a suture and it is kind of glued like that. that there is scientific evidence to show that it's not necessarily going to expand. Despite what all these devices are saying, because there's a lot of devices on the market, I personally believe a lot of those devices are not giving true, proper palatal expansion where the suture is moving. But what they're doing is pushing teeth outwards so that it's like a fake palatal expansion. So people feel like, oh, I'm better, I can breathe better because we move teeth so it's a little more room. However, long term, from what I've read, um, that's more risk for periodontal disease because you're pushing teeth out of bone. So I think it's a really tricky line. Now, from what I've read, you can do like a MSE with, it's called puncture, they'll puncture the palate. Sounds terrible, to be honest. They puncture the palate and then you do the MSE, MSE device, which will actually open the palate. And that is the only route I would say would be actually positive to do that won't create, I mean, it will still create some other body issues, I'm sure, because it's so severe on your structure and your cranium. But I'd say that's the only true palatal expansion. There's difference between, between tooth-borne palatal expansion and tissue-borne. And that's something to know for children, too. I see that all the time where these kids are getting like ALFs and that's not the proper way to expand a child's palate. You want to use MSE device. I think one's called Hyrax. I'm not a dentist, so don't quote me, but there's definitely certain devices that are tissue borne that are actually moving the palate to be expanded versus moving teeth out. And that's, I think, an important aspect. But I think expanding a palate can be great. It's just, again, it's timing and it depends. And unfortunately, our modern society uh, we just have a lot of this really narrow narrowing of the palate going on. It's not great. And um, I know who there's, um, I read his book, Dr. Felix Lau, Liao, and it's a great book. And he talks about just like chewing food. Little kids should be chewing hard, crunchy food. If you look in Africa at these people with beautiful jaws, it's because they're eating crunchy, hard food. It's, we're just, our culture is not set up for success <laughs> really uh, as ironic as it is it's almost like strength could be the option or the, the, the move right there <laughs> yeah i just like i'm not at the point where i'm having kids yet but my kids are gonna be eating like steak yeah i'm gonna give mav a tomahawk when we get back yeah. <laughs> um okay so what about um how would you describe good tongue posture okay so and tongue posture is also a difficult subject because we do have a lot of people in today's society with different gene mutations that can actually influence having a tongue tie or just have tongue ties. And so we really want tongue to rest on the roof of the mouth uh, b behind the front two teeth. And we want the whole tongue to be able to rest up there. Not everyone has the ability to do so. I myself have a tongue tie. I can't get my posterior tongue up there. So we can do myofunctional therapy to assist with that movement. But yeah, that's really where you want the tongue to be. You want it to be lifted upwards. And that is very relaxing for the nervous system to be able to get it there. You see people with that dropped tongue or mouth breathing, really long face. That's a pretty sympathetic response. Okay. And then in terms of the, um, the nostrils in your airway, the left nostril would be associated with uh, relaxation. Yeah. And is the eye also going to have a correlation in that way? That's interesting. I mean, I wouldn't necess necessarily say it's exactly relaxation, but when I put someone into a left stance position and I block off maybe with a baseball hat, their right eye, their body will relax. So kind of. Okay. I think left yeah, I mean, sided stuff does. Relaxation is obviously not super scientific. Well, parasympathetic. Yeah, if you had a really yeah, big yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So I would say, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's something that I get asked a lot. Yeah. Um, what about mewing? So um, 
I know we briefly talked about it, but uh, what are your thoughts on it? Do you have any experience with it? Yeah, I have experience with it like some of my patients doing it and telling me that they overdid it. So I think with anything in life, you don't really want to overdo anything. That comes to all modalities and you just don't want to get too pigeonholed into one thing. I've never done it, so I couldn't tell you from my experience. I myself have tried myofunctional therapy and I like that because it really does a lot of, it's like a verse, a lot of things that you're doing. You're not just doing one thing. I think mewing can be a little difficult when people overdo it. I don't think, the actual movement is necessarily negative, just holding your tongue up there. But I think people press it too hard to the roof of the mouth and overdo it. They're doing it hundreds of times a day and they're not really in the right tongue posture. Whereas myofunctional therapy, you're doing lots of movements with your tongue. You're learning how to flatten, you're learning how to you know, dome, all these things that make sense for chewing, swallowing, breathing and just being normal parasympathetic. So I think mewing could be a piece of it, but I know most myofunctional therapists don't, aren't the biggest fans of doing that all day. So I think it's like, goes back to, you never want to do something your entire day. <laughs> uh, so to summarize, maybe there, there's value in it, but there's just the right way of going right, about it. Right, exactly. Okay, cool. What are some of the, um, I know you kind of mentioned some of them, but maybe just uh, kind of summarize them, but the, uh, what are some of the red flags for teeth? What are some of the red flags for vision? So yeah. um, you mentioned uh, bumping into stuff for, for vision. Yeah. You mentioned grinding teeth. Are yeah. there any others that you didn't mention? Yeah, so for vision, when I'm assessing somebody's gait, like where is their eyes? Are their eyes always going to the ground? That's an important one for me. Um, wh what else I told about the bumping into things from furniture, that's like a pretty important aspect, car sickness. Those are really, really big ones, of Just course. Just being in the car or actually reading in the car? Well, should you be able to read in the car? I don't know if you should. I don't know, because that do not feel good. I get car sick that. too. Yeah. I, here's the deal with the car. Most people don't get car sick when they're driving because they're in control. They yeah. know where the car is going. But yeah. ultimately, you're sitting down. You're moving through space. Things are passing you, but your body's not physically moving. Yeah. So it makes sense why we would get car sick. Yeah. But at the same time, I think little kids get really, really car sick. I think they're just like adjusting their vestibular system. It doesn't really get it. I think we shouldn't necessarily get car sick because we do it so much. But if you're getting severely car sick and boat sick and all these things, that tells me something about how your system isn't able to stabilize. Although boats too, your feet are like so ungrounded. Yeah. So it makes sense why you would. And no, I don't think you sh we should read in the car. Yeah, me either. It makes me nauseous too. So then what about teeth? And Grinding teeth. teeth um, yeah. Obviously pain, T and yeah. J would be a big one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So of course, like having any clicking, popping, drop pain, really limited opening. Um, if I'm seeing different things on the tongue, like a scallop tongue, or if I'm seeing that the person's tongue is very strictly tied, it tells me about their nervous system. Teeth itself, I'm looking for crossbite. So that means like one tooth is kind of coming out in front of the other tooth. I'm also looking to see if teeth have a midline shift. There's a bunch of different things with the occlusion course in PRI that you learn about looking at teeth and that dentists have taught me as well because there's different classes of bites on each side you can kind of look for, how well they line up, do they fit in the grooves properly, is there an underbite, is there a huge overbite, and are these things going to impede long term or can I bypass them with my PRI techniques. Uh, grinding is a big one. You could see major flattening of teeth. Um, cross bites is pretty big, which I just mentioned. I'm trying to think what else. But those are like the real big ones. Pain is big too. What do you think about, this is something that we posted about a few times, the idea that like you can change your breathing patterns, you can change your posture, and that your face will actually react to it. And just like building muscle to a certain extent, over time, your face can actually change the mm. structure of it, the mm. appearance of it. Um, is that something that you believe in that you think you've seen? Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen it with my own face. When I got my own dental appliance, my face completely evened out. It wasn't just from the appliance, it was actually from a lot of PRI techniques as well. My face evened out, my eyes leveled. I've seen it for sure change. I've seen people's eyes completely level out. You know, we look at these external asymmetries. If one eye is higher, it tells me something. If one, if the nose is deviated right versus left, etc., it tells me it's a piece of the picture. So if I can make those external asymmetries symmetry is a little bit more symmetrical. It tells me that that person is able to handle their intracranial pressure and just pressure internally. So yeah, I think you could definitely make changes. Do I think it's gonna happen overnight? No, but I've seen it happen pretty, like faster than what people would expect. Okay. But you can make changes. And then what about 
Would you consider the nostril airway similar to the palate in terms of the, I guess we'll just stick to the same age, the 46 year old that oh. feels like they're blocked in their nasal passage, just like the person who feels like their tongue is constricted. Yeah. Could you, in theory, make changes to the nasal passage and expand it so that it's easier to breathe over time? You know, this is interesting because I just took the cranial course and we talked a lot about the nasal passage. That's pretty much what the whole course was on. And it's really interesting because my, my most difficult people that I work with have had septoplasties and rhinoplasties, yeah. period. Those are the most difficult. Explain what, what those so are. So septoplasty is when they actually like break your septum and then they fix it. So it was deviated, let's say, or there was a traumatic injury. It was deviated and then break it and fix it. And then rhinoplasty is basically a nose job. It's a pretty easy way to describe it. So they're fixing the aesthetic components of the nose. Sometimes that includes septoplasty, sometimes not. It happens to be that that to me has been the most, those are the most difficult cases because once that is changed, it's changed usually on a body that's patterned where they're dominant to the right side. You're not getting a septoplasty at seven years old. You're getting it when you're a full blown adult, 18, et cetera. So when it comes to palatal expansion, I think that happens to be they do it at a young age and kids can, you know, get through it and they're pretty resilient. When it comes to palatal expansion as an adult, I think, again, it really depends on the person, depends on their body. A lot of people feel a lot better when they do a true palatal expansion. When it comes to rhinoplasty, septoplasty, I notice that people cannot breathe and then they're just fixing the nose. That doesn't necessarily mean the autonomic nervous system has been fixed along with it. It actually doesn't mean the autonomic nervous system has been fixed along with it. It means that we just fix this person's ability to breathe, but it's faulty because they don't actually know how to properly breathe. So it's a really complicated thing because I don't recommend any nasal surgery. I know Ron only recommends like a roto rooter, which is like they go and clean it out and then just like unblock you a little bit, but there's no damage really being done with that. So I think that is really complicated because it can really impede on how your brain understands respiration more than mouth stuff. Yeah, I, I kind of see it as thinking about if the left side isn't necessary for really relaxing, relaxating, uh, relaxing, then if it's constantly blocked, no matter you, what you do, how are I you know. really truly ever going to, you know, relax? Yeah. You definitely have to be doing all the things. So like mouth tape, I think is something I utilize all the time. I think it's very important that people breathe through their nose. And I do think it's like, you know, once you stop using it, you're going to lose it. If you stop using your nose, you will lose the ability to access that breath pathway. And if you don't use it, that's it, right? But if you start to use it again, you're going to get nasal flow. You're going to get there. You might have to mouth tape and go on a hike where you're really getting flow. You're Starts moving. A little. Yeah, because when you walk and when you go on a hike and you're in nature, things pass in your optic flow and you're, you know, really moving. Your sphenoid can move into all different positions. Your temporal bones can move. Your jaw mandible is moving. That's when you're going to get nasal flow. So I think tried everything is tough because to me, trying everything would be like mouth tape, nasal dilator to open up the nose or the strips, yeah. right? Yikes. And go on a hike. Yeah. Use, I use um, doTERRA's breathe oil and I started to recommend it to people. It's amazing. It, it opens up everything. And so if you're doing that, use that, then go on a hike, go out in nature, try and get that open before you do anything surgically. I think that is important. What do you think about, let's get into the, the shoes and before to segue to the shoes, one of the things that I've seen you and other PRI people talk about is the idea that it's common for someone who has like a very narrow palate. So things like narrow at the top, the roof of the mouth can also be um, kind of analogous with uh, narrow or high arches. Mm, yeah. So yeah, we see that palate they, they notice palate is, uh, can be very asymmetrical. And this is actually why Ron, so PRI, Ron is the founder of PRI, and we study from like his research and his library, I don't know, it's insane. I, when I walked in there earlier this year, I was like, he has every book that would be so interesting to read, and he has post-its in every single one. It's wild. But the man is brilliant, and so he really got into understanding more about asymmetries because he saw palatal asymmetries, and he was, really fascinated by it from what I've heard and kind of from what he's told me too. So 
On the feet, we see, we tend to see a higher right arch and a more flattened left arch. But in the palate, we see the opposite a lot of times. Um, that's not always, everybody's different. And you, if you do see opposite at the feet and opposite in the palate, it tells you a story and it tells you where that, what that person maybe has been through. But in general, when you see a really high vaulted palate, like that's a question I'll ask is like, did you suck your thumb? That's an important question. But when it comes to the connection between the feet is really that they're asymmetrical and that you're seeing this mirrored image up at the palate. So it's kind of something that you can even look at with people and see. Okay, and then let's get into the shoes. So the hot want, topic. Should I grab my shoes and you can tell everybody yeah. you hate them? Yeah. And love them? Uh, they look cool. Uh, okay, they look okay, cool. Okay, so you go ahead and just start talking about they why the cool. shoes are important. I'll grab them. So this is like a hated topic, but I'm going to try to like be careful with it and just give you guys the information about it that I think is the most necessary that I think will help the majority of people. So Ian has ultras, which ultras are really known for a wide toe box. And I actually love the idea of having a wide toe box. And unfortunately, we just talked about this. A lot of the shoes on the PRI shoe list don't have a super wide toe box. It's just hard to find everything in a, in a perfect shoe. But the reason I don't like these ultras, so they're all right there, but I don't like this aspect. And if you can see, it just fold the entire heel down. So there's nothing that guides Ian's calcaneus to tell the talus bone where to position. The talus can collapse in or lift up, and that could be the reason for a high or low arch in somebody. Um, the arch in here is actually not that bad. It's just really the real reason I don't like it is this. I don't know too much about like you can kind of see lateral yeah, heel good. Show, show yours yeah, the, uh, and then the, there's just like not enough heel counter there. So if you look at my shoes, which is a PRI, um, they're like an older model Asics. If I squeeze, it, you can see that it's really tight and it doesn't collapse. So it holds my calcaneus in a great position to guide my talus. And the talus actually is a real connection with the neck and keeping free. And then it has a nice bend at the front, so that's the toe off position. And then you have a nice arch in there. So those are like the three main things. I really don't like barefoot shoes. I actually wore barefoot shoes in New York City for four years. Terrible. And I had heel pain like every day of my yeah. life. I, w I remember buying them in London at the Vivo Barefoot store. I thought it was so cool. Yeah. And the problem, I mean, we all go through these learning journeys. It's part of it. But there's more to shoes than just a shoe itself. And it's not really about biomechanics. Like biomechanics are very important and it's a piece of the puzzle. But the overarching theme is that neurologically, your body needs to feel your arches, needs to feel a heel counter for your brain to relax a little bit. So arches are really tied in with the parasympathetic nervous system. Yeah, and I think that's very hard for people to understand. So let me, yeah. let me ask you this. Let's use a, an avatar of a person who is just perfect somehow, right? Okay. No chronic pain. Perfect. They've been barefoot forever. Sure. They grew up with the Maasai tribe in Africa. <laughs> Great. They were raised by wolves That's on the That's why side. they're barefoot, they're yeah. They're great. So anyway, this person, they put on a pair of shoes like this and they're not gonna have any issues because their calcaneus and their talus have a great relationship. They've been communicating with their neck a lot. They're best friends. They probably have Hang a beautiful jaw. Yeah, and, and then it's just no issue. Right. But that's just not the type of person that we're, me and you are basically no, seeing. We're right. not in that society. And I do think that people of Africa and like the different continents where they're really one with the land, those people do not need these shoes. So and if, uh, I think this is a good summary. So the, you want stability, you want guidance, you want a feeling of safety from your shoes. In the ideal world, that would all come with a wide toe box, but yeah. that doesn't exist yet. Right. We've called ASICs, they were not very nice. No, they were nice. We <laughs> need to talk to the big dog Ron to get in there. Um, and. Uh, you can work towards wearing any shoe, but it just takes time and proper progression, yeah. which is really realistic. I think people can get behind that. Yeah, I mean, I think you can like hike in barefoot shoes and you can try and train barefoot and go in the sand barefoot and go outside grounding barefoot. I am all for that. I think it's great to connect with the earth. But I just think with our modern society, we grew up on these flat surfaces. Like you learn to walk on a flat floor. You did not learn to walk in the forest of whatever, Kenya, you just didn't. And so I think that it's just something to think about because we're living in modern society. It's just a bit different. Um, so it's almost like we're bringing the outdoors to the foot because we're giving the foot arch for pronation, 
heel for guidance. We're giving these things that you would get from the outside to the foot versus just putting on a barefoot shoe and saying, oh, let's walk on flat surfaces all the time. So. Yeah, concrete is concrete no matter what. Yeah. I think that's a good way. And I like the idea of like not, especially if you've been dealing with anything, it's like that's why the shoes are such an easy win. I think that's a good way to describe yeah. them because it's like if we can make you feel safer just with $125 and a terrible colorway, then we can do that. <laughs> I and know. Just get you started and you, you go right into it. And it's an easy win without having to do a bunch of techniques or do – uh, you know, cardio or, you know, it's just like put these pair of shoes on, they're going to help you. And I think that's a great win. Yeah. So let's, um, let's finish up with uh, one more thing that I want you to say that I'm going to lead you into because I think it's so important for everybody who even searches PRI. Okay. Is the idea that what do you think about the idea that you have to just do PRI, that you should stop lifting, that getting back to lifting isn't the goal, that everything needs to look like PRI, you know, can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah. To up? So I spend my day teaching people how to get out of pain using postural restoration. And this morning I lifted weights for an hour and I did cardio and I have yet to do a technique today. I might do one before I leave, maybe one for two sets. But I don't think the goal should ever be to do something all the time because then you're becoming obsessive and you're actually doing the opposite of what the institute wants you to do. The institute wants you to use this as a modality if you're struggling, if you're in pain, if you have hormone issues, POTS, etc. whatever you might be dealing with, neurological problems. They want you to use this framework to get better and then they want you to live your life. So Torin and I actually we did a podcast and Torin brought up how on one of the things that they like give out it's like a lifestyle thing. Um, with techniques in it, the person, the people that are in it, they're, hold, they're holding hands while walking. So we should be swinging our arms while walking, holding hands while walking, wearing flip-flops. And the goal of that was to get you to think, this is what life should be like on the suburbs, just doing the things you want to do. PRI is a framework to help get you there if you need it. It is not something to obsess about. And you should not, like, you see me sitting here, I'm on my right side. I'm not thinking about it. I'm trying to have a conversation. I'm going to do it in what makes me the most comfortable. I'm not sitting here like this and having this conversation with you. It's just, it's not supposed to be an obsessive thought. And if you are like that, I would give you the advice to try and tone it down a little bit and try and find other things to help you relax. Maybe meditate, do some other parasympathetic activities because you might be obsessing over it and that's not going to fix you. Yeah. And zone two cardio is a great, don't you know, do you know just swing your arms, don't think, listen to a podcast, yeah. just move more. I think that a lot of the people that get caught in that trap are also people that just need to move more in a lot of ways yeah. too, because a lot of the benefits that you get from a lot of the techniques and all that stuff are not necessarily re replaced, but can be facilitated by things like if we're going to spend all our time getting better walking, like, have you considered walking and just doing it for 20 minutes? If you're going to get so good at breathing, have you considered walking and breathing with your mouth shut? You no, know I what I mean? So like simple things like that. The other thing that I wanted to finish up with is like, just, just both of us reiterating that PRI isn't training. I think a lot of the great stuff with PRI gets lost in um, translation, especially with my population of the trainers, because you're looking for something that it isn't. It never was supposed to replace your training. Right. So you're going to be disappointed or you're going to go too far down a rabbit hole that takes you away from, like, you still have to train at the end of the day if you want to be strong and resilient. Yeah. You can't relax yourself into being strong. That's really the, just yeah. the, the truth. And nobody that is actually in PRI or, being, or teaching it or really part of the Institute is, uh, is ever saying that. I've never once heard that. It's not part of it. I don't know where that has come along that this has become, like, P that these exercises are supposed to be, they're not going to make you stronger. Yeah, they're going to neurologically help you understand your left side that might be lacking from your life. They're not going to necessarily make you stronger. They might put you in a better position so you can feel a better right glute and then you can grow it better, yeah. but they are not meant to make you um, a bodybuilder and yeah. hypertrophy and all that stuff. And uh, I think that's a really gr great point and yeah. I think it should be made. Um, because nobody from the Institute says that and I'm not I don't work for the Institute I just represent what I think the science is brilliant So I just want to represent them proudly and I I think they would really agree with all everything said in this so great awesome Yeah, okay, so let's wrap up and you um again. We know you're in New York. What's kind of the best way to reach you Instagram? Your yeah, website? 
Yeah, so I'm traveling a lot. I'll probably be traveling for the next like six, seven months, mainly because I enjoy traveling. I like to hike. I like to get out of New York City. If you're in New York City, I am here. I'll be here for a few months this summer. Um, and I'll be in, just tell you the places I'll be in. Toronto, I'll be in San Diego for a month, LA, Toronto, I just said, Seattle, uh, Texas, probably won't see people, uh, maybe in Austin, and then um, back in New York. So I'm gonna be all over the States for a little bit, um, maybe Italy next year. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. And if you wanna reach me, my Instagram is my name, Alina Canner, at Alina Canner, and my website is the same thing, Alina Canner. Com. Great newsletter too. Breath of fresh air. Breath of yeah, but I'm like I haven't done it in a while. Yeah, I, maybe I'll get back into it's, it. It's, it's just, funny, right? It's, it's a good. It's, it's good. a good name. It's good. You know. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate you. Um, everybody, make sure you like, subscribe, share it. Take a little screenshot of you watching it. Put it on your Instagram. Tag us both. Um, those things like just go so long. So pr please do that. And uh, if you have any questions, let them know below, or let us know below in the comments, and we'll have Alina jump on what I can't answer and uh, help everybody out. Thank so, you. Enjoy the rest of your day.